Eric Morris, that's my name. Eric Morris, uh, you've been teaching theater and acting for... No, I've been teaching theater at all. Uh -oh. I've been teaching <laughs> acting. I have a theater background, but okay. I haven't been teaching acting. Okay. Yes. So when you were a younger person, you studied theater? Did you study theater in college? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a, I have a bachelor's degree. Uh, I was a theater major at Northwestern University, graduated in 1954. I was a theater major there, and I've done, I guess, altogether about 50 equity plays. 30 or slightly more than that were in summer stock. I did three seasons of summer stock. So you do 10 plays a season. So yeah, I have a theater background, but in 1954, I came out here. I was drafted, went into the Army, and I started my career in 1957 in Hollywood. And I've been doing films as an actor from then on. Of course, I did a few plays in Hollywood too, but mostly films, television, you know? You asked me how long I've been teaching. 50, 57 years. Did you first start teaching here in California? Yes. And who was your mentor? Well, I have to say that I had a lot of acting teachers in college and a lot of uh, directors in theater, but I guess the most influential teacher I had was a protege of Lee Strasberg's, Martin Landau. And actually, I have to credit him with putting me on the right course and on the right journey. Up until I studied with him, <clears throat> everything I'd been exposed to, college and Everywhere else was general, cerebral, intellectual, and there was no how. And so I always say that from Marty I learned, I went from A to E, A, B, C, D, E, and I had an alphabet that I could spell words with. I'm giving you a metaphor. <clears throat> and it was the first time I had a how, or the beginnings of a how. And from there, I went off on my own over the, over the period of a half a century, and I created my own system based on Stanislavski, the method. Uh, I was influenced by Lee Strasberg. I was at the actor's studio for about eight years. <clears throat> and uh, I created my own system, and I have actually seven books on my system uh, that detail it totally to this point. Of course, I keep adding to it, so it's kind of a non-ending journey, you know? Had you read any books that influenced your way of looking at acting that you felt were important in terms of your development? Well, I, the standard books. No. To the Actor, uh, the Stanislavski books, uh, Creating a Character, My Life in Art, uh, those books, The first, first Six Lessons in Acting by Richard Boleslavsky. Uh, I read The Crafts of Comedy by Athene Saylor and Stephen Haggard. I read a lot of books, but actually, besides the inspiration that they might have stimulated, I went off on my own thing. I really, see, my, my, my system is really based on Stanislavsky. But I think, I, I relate to it like this. This is not, and I, I, I want to make it clear, this is not an ego trip at all. This is fact. Stanislavski was the foundation for what I did. It's like building a house. Created the foundation and maybe even a little bit of the framing. And then I was influenced by Lee Strasberg. And there was a basic foundation to all of that. But what haunted me, I, don't, I use the word haunted, but because I was so frustrated. I, my teacher in Northwestern was Alvina Krauss. She was famous. I think she was infamous, actually. She, she, she had teachers like, uh, I mean, she had students like Charlton Heston, uh, Richard Benjamin, uh, Patricia Neal, good people. But it took me years to find out she didn't know anything about acting. I didn't really learn anything from her at all. And she was kind of a phony, really. And I say that with, with due respect to the fact that I learned nothing from her. And on the journey that I was on, I was very frustrated. I used to ask teachers, well, 
okay, how do I do that? He said, oh, you know, you think about it, you remember it. But how do, how do I get to that authentic, organic, emotional place? Oh, well, you recall it. That's not a how. That's not a how. So I was, I was driven to discover the hows. How do you, how do you do it? What is the, what's the process? What is the approach, the technique, how? Nobody could answer it. Until I got into Marty's class and there was a how there, the beginnings of a how. No, there was a how there, but it was, it was the beginning of my journey really, because I've gone light years beyond that particular influence. But I, I'm grateful to him and I'm grateful to Lee Strasberg. I think Lee was a, a genius probably knew more about theater than any living person before or after. But he was limited by his own emotional obstacles, his own emotional obstacles. He was limited by those. So he didn't go as far as with a technique or teaching actors as I believe he may have if he wasn't, wasn't limited by his own, his own demons, you know. I'm, I'm going to cut right to the chase. I said before, I teach people how not to act. What I have been doing for over a half a century is I've been dealing with liberating the actor, his instrument, her instrument, the actor's instrument. What does that mean? I've been doing what I call instrumental therapy work to liberate the actor from obstacles, fears, tension, uh, dependencies, uh, uh, habits, uh, isms, redirections, compensations. I could go on for a whole day telling you all of the obstacles and issues and problems that actors have. So I've been dedicating myself to working with actors to liberate their instruments so they were free to act, to get rid of the obstacles, the fear, the tension, the concerns, the the dependency, the, the, the religious fears, the social fears, etc. And in my first 10 years of teaching, I took a lot, of, a, a, a lot of criticism for that. They used to make fun of me. You say, oh, you're going to Eric Morris's acting class? Are you gonna lay down on the couch and talk about how your mother damaged you? And that went on for a long time, for about 10, 12, 15 years. And you know when it stopped? I'll tell you when it stopped. People would go on the Johnny Carson show or one of the other night uh, talk shows, nighttime talk shows, and they'd say, I didn't know anything about acting until I went to Eric Morris, nothing. And these were famous people. These were people who were movie stars. And so pretty soon the criticism stopped and it went away. And then the respect for what I was doing kind of elevated, but I'm still very controversial to this day and time, to this day and time. People say, oh boy, I don't know. You know, He's pretty rough, it's pretty intense there, it's pretty intense. I don't know how intense it is. I don't think there's any separation between living and acting. And if you, if you can't liberate your instrument to, to act, to not act, then, then, then you're, you're damaged and you're, you're in a place where you have obstacles to being able to be organic, honest, and experiential. Let's talk about experiential. I teach people how to be professional experiencers. What does that mean? It means that <laughs> this, is a, this, this is a mystery. Stanislavski, 100 years ago, said, the actor must experience in reality what the character in the play is experiencing. And that statement went over everybody's head for a hundred years. For a hundred years. It, it would like flew into the ether. It was gone. It didn't go over my head. So in the last 30, 35 years, I've emphasized the, the, the word experiential. The only difference between what Stanislavski said was that he didn't really create or instruct actors on how to accomplish that? Well, I have. I mean, it's true, you know. Anything I say that sounds like, you know, some kind of ego trip, 
I can back it up with fact. So I'm not going to be worried about that. But what I've done is I've helped actors to become experiential in their work. In other words, the only missing link in the, well, let's go back to that part. Then I'll talk about Stanislavski a little bit. The only missing link in the method and in the training of actors categorically for the last hundred years is, and this is a tragedy, it doesn't make me happy, that nobody that I know of, and I've been doing this for a long enough time to know who's out there, deals with the actor's instrument on a really deep and meaningful level to liberate, to allow the actor to be free, free from, free from everything that keeps us as people, social obligations, etc., from being comfortable being who we are. So that whole thing about teaching acting and the missing link in that is that to my knowledge there isn't anybody out there dealing with the instrument on the level that I am or have been in any really meaningful depth. Strasberg said when an actor would say anything about what he was working for, Strasbourg would say, well, what do you want to tell us after he would watch the scene? The actor would say, well, Lee, I was dealing with a, a issue I had with my mother. Stop, stop, I don't want to hear about it. Save it for your therapist. Lee Strasberg was terrified of crossing the line between what he said was acting and therapy, psychology. Well, I'm not afraid of that. But anyway, that's what, re that's what really limited him and the other thousands of teachers out there that are first unqualified to do it for the most part. I don't say they're all unqualified, but nobody's doing it. Nobody's dealing with the actor's instrument in depth in terms of alleviating and liberating and freeing the actor. I have a book on freeing the actor, one of, one of my last books. And what it is, essentially, is a, a compilation of all the problems that actors have and how to antidote them. Exercises, techniques, approaches, how to antidote them. I'm going to get back to Stanislavski for a minute. hundred years ago he said, an actor needs to experience what the character in the play is experiencing. But he didn't say how to do that. How do you do that is you identify the character's responsibilities the author's intentions, and you use your own life experiences as choices to affect you and stimulate the life of your life that parallels the character's life. And that's how you really become an experiential actor. And in order to do that, my process is divided into two sections, the instrument and the craft. The instrument is the actor, his mind, the body, the voice, the, the emotions. That's, that's, that's the instrument. The craft is the process by which I use and have created on how to address and fulfill all the elements, all the obligations of dramatic material. I, I have seven major obligations I list. I don't want to go into them. But uh, the craft is designed to address time and place, relationship. I am going into them, I guess. Uh, character, emotional life, uh, the emotion of the, uh, of, of the character, uh, and uh, the actual uh, underpinnings of the play, the message of the play. So uh, essentially there are seven major obligations and they don't all relate to a single piece of material. If it's a, a contemporary piece of material, you have no historical obligation. That's one of the eight, obliga seven obligations, historical. So if you're doing a contemporary piece of material, you don't have a historical obligation. But if you're doing something even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, society was different then. And you have to, you have to accommodate that, you know? So anyway, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy with what I've done. I'm very happy with what I've accomplished with this work. And this work is profoundly life-changing. I get letters from people I 
had in my class 35 years ago, expressing their gratitude to me and how this work, this work has affected their lives. And, and I'm, that's the perk, that's, that's, that, that's the fulfillment I have. I make a living and I pay my bills. That's ancillary to me, that's an ancillary thing. To me, the greatest level of fulfillment in my life is what people gain from the work and how it liberates their life, changes their life, makes them more open, happier people, and much better actors. And that's it, really, you know? And that's what's important to me. Top, what, what, what did I just you say? You were talking about Actors Studios. You wanted to direct. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah. And we're rolling. OK. Yeah, there was a period in my life uh, I, I acted for, you know, I've done, my God, a lot of acting. I've done two series. One was a network series. I had a running part in that. Didn't last very long. The New Phil Silver Show in 1964. And then I did 39 segments of a syndicated show called Eyewitness to the Past. I was the host moderator who interviewed famous people from history, Mussolini, Hitler, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln, uh, uh, Jefferson, uh, presidents, and famous people. And it was a wonderful uh, opportunity. Actually, it was like taking a four-year course in history because I had to read up on everybody I was interviewing. So it was wonderful. But getting back to what I was saying, um, I thought I would, I did, I did direct. I directed about eight plays here and around in the actor studio. I did uh, several uh, projects that actually were audience, uh, uh, invited audiences. That was, not, that was un, unheard of at the actor's studio. And I, I did uh, several. Uh, and they, play, they, they, you know, they actually played at the actor's studio. I guess above and beyond Lee Strasberg's uh, permission. But he was in New York, and uh, we did them. But anyway, I thought, but I st I'm going to segue into directing film. The book I was going to tell you about, The Four C's of Cinematography, it's one of the best film books I've ever read. It's really incredible. Anyway, so I was at the actor's studio at the time. There were a couple of directors there. And Lou Antonio is a wonderful actor. He's done some wonderful stuff. And he's a director. And he invited me uh, down to watch him direct a sitcom. I forget what it was. It was a sitcom. Uh, a woman, four children, I forget the name of the show. The Brady Bunch. Or something like that. And I think it was that. I don't know. Anyway, I, I stood there watching him for the whole day. At lunchtime, we sat down. And he said, well, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a journey. It, it's difficult making the transition from a director, from a television director, into film director. That's a hard uh, transition for most people. And I just thought to myself, in all due respect to Lou Antonio, who I think is a very talented man, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do the Brady Bunch. It was, an, it was actually was, it was another sitcom of that ilk, that nature. Uh, yeah, it, it was something like that. So I don't want to spend my life doing stuff like this. So I kind of just backed away from my thought of maybe I should direct film. I don't want to do this. This is not. This is. This is so unfulfilling to me, you know. So I I I kept writing books and teaching all my classes. Here's, a, here's, here's an interesting thing. In the 57 years of teaching, I've never taken a sabbatical. I take a month, well now I take a month off in the summer and a month off during Christmas holidays. But even, that's only just lately in the last 10 years. Before that, I take a week here and a week there. I have never taken a sabbatical. 
So I've been teaching regularly, three, four classes a week. I do intensives once a month with the same people. My wife does that, I work with her. Uh, I would do jamborees, week-long jamborees. So we do, I'm happy doing that. I don't need to have my name directed by Eric Morris. I don't need it. You know, I feel that what I'm doing is exactly what I should be doing. That's, that's it, you know? I mean, uh, what really surprised me was Picasso. Uh, no, it wasn't Picasso, it was, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, the the surrealist who uh, let clocks that were... Dali. Yeah, Salvatore Dali, that's him. I was shocked. I went to, in St. Petersburg, Florida, he has a museum. He was a wonderful, conventional painter, and a talented one, who decided that wasn't his medium. He wanted to do something else, and he segued into surrealism and so if that's what if that what excited him and gave him the juice to do it more power to anybody who makes that decision my decision was not not to do sitcom and not to do television and not to to stay there all day and have a schedule on which you've got to bring this in in the three or four days you're shooting that's not for me I see where you've gone and read your books, uh, talked with you, I have an understanding of your life in a basic way. There's a mystery for me. I, I, I'm curious to know if you've ever figured out how acting found you. How, from your growing up, going through school like the rest of us, how did it, how I, did you suddenly say, oh, I'm oh no, no, I can, I, I can tell you specifically. It's not a mystery. No, it's not. Okay. I was, you talked about photography earlier, I was going to be a professional photographer, okay? My brothers, both of them were in theater. My brother Ed, Ed Morris, was originally an actor, turned into being a writer, pretty good writer. Wrote 30 films and a lot of television. Wrote a wonderful play called uh, The Wooden Dish. Played, it was translated into 11 languages, different. And my brother Phil was a techie. He was a production stage manager. Uh, he did, later in his life, he became a producer of television, uh, anthologies. So I, I really didn't think about acting. I wanted to be a photographer. And so I was, at that time, graduating from high school, 17 and a half. And I started to think about, and I did, send out some applications to some pho pho photography schools. Rochester, New York, the Kodak had a school at that time, and a couple of other places. My brother Phil came into Chicago with Finian's Rainbow, the musical. He was the production stage manager for that. I went backstage. The first week it was there, and his assistant stage manager was an actor also. His name was Norman Shelley. And uh, Norman Shelley later played uh, in, uh, in a play where he played uh, an alligator, uh, Peter Pan. And uh, Norman was his assistant. He introduced, hi, hi there, how are you? And he looked at me and said, hey, listen, kid. He said, be careful, there's a bug flying around here somewhere, and if you get bit by it, it's fatal. I said, what, what's he talking about? My brother, Phil, was standing there and said, oh, come on, dummy. He's talking about the acting bug. I said, no way. I'm never going to do that, no. Okay, so I standing in the portals, the overture started to Finian's Rainbow. The curtain went up. The Dancers jumped on stage. My eyes got as big as two soft boiled eggs. And I went backstage every night for four months that it was in Chicago at the Erlinger Theater. And I've never done anything else since that time. What year was that? 
I'll tell you exactly. It was 1948, 49. And you were somewhere around 17? I was 17 years old. I've never done anything else. And I'll tell you something, and I even get vulnerable talking about it. <laughs> Whenever I hear the overture to Finian's Rainbow, the tears roll down my eyes like somebody opened a faucet. And even talking about it, I, because it's, it's the origin of my being. That's where it all started. There's something that happened in you that you recognized a part of yourself that you, yeah. just, that you hadn't fully been aware of. And I gave up the idea of photography because this took over my life. And except for some part-time jobs, when I was married and in school, uh, I did some uh, telephone soliciting, marketing. I worked in a lot of different things. I worked for my cousin as an apprentice mechanic, worked for my brother-in-law as a liquor salesman. Uh, except for a few car, a, a number of part-time jobs, I've never done anything that wasn't acting, theater, teaching, directing, or whatever. I have a question in the segue directly to what you said just now. Yeah. Can it be construed that at its core, yeah. the human species is a group of actors? I think so, yeah. I think, uh, I'm going to piggyback that. I'm going to piggy piggyback that. I always say that if you scratch just below the upper uh, layer of a person's skin, the epidermal layer of the person's skin, everybody has thought at one time or another, I'd like to be an actor. And that's true. I mean, that's 100% true. And uh, I talk to people in various, you know, walks of life and they say, yeah, I gave it some thought, but I had a family. Oh, I gave it some thought, but I don't think I could have made a living at it. I, I got practical. Yeah, I did some, some, I did a play in college. Uh, I have a friend, his name is Elkana Burns. He's a lawyer. He was at uh, the Naval Academy. He flew in Vietnam, actually. He graduated the Naval Academy and he went to pilot training. And while he was at the Academy, he did a play and he got bit. Finished his tour of duty, went to Washington opened a law office, got past, you know, past the bar and everything. And somebody took him to my class. I was teaching in Washington on a weekend workshop. You must have taken one of those, right? And it, from, that on, from then on, all he wanted to do was act. He gave up his law firm and moved to Hollywood with the intention of being a professional actor. And that's, that's a fact. So when you say, can you dig deep enough at the core, at the core? Yes, it's at the core, it's at the core. I guess I don't know what else I can tell you. It seems to me that of the arts, theater in particular, acting training, really expose this deep human desire to have freedom of self-expression. And that in some way in our society, people feel very constrained. 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 Oh, yeah. Well, that's what I'm talking about when I'm teaching people how to liberate their instrument. The instrumental therapy I do. Most people are very, very constrained and socially obligated. And, you know, I look at my class and I say, every one of you, including me, are damaged. By growing up in our society, we're damaged. I and if you don't repair that damage, it follows you to the grave. And that's true. You know? Okay. Yeah, so, so the arts as a path uh, towards a healthier society seems pretty compelling as an idea. You said something very important when we were out there before we started this. See if you can recall it. See if you can resurrect it. You said without art, there would be no society. There would be no evidence for civilization. Without art, there would be no evidence of civilization. Something else you said. Or, Without the arts, there'd be 
No evidence. We'd have no proof of it. I think that's brilliant. I think it's a brilliant statement. I'm going to use it. <laughs> it's a brilliant statement. You should use it. Okay. Eric, you've got a very expressive face. I don't need to tell you this. No, no. I guess not. You've, you've been liberated as an actor. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, you're free to express yourself. Oh, I'm still working on myself. Is it, aren't we all? Now, isn't it interesting from what you just said um, that people who were your critics who thought that you were becoming too much like a therapist or, you know, Sigmund Freud or something seem to be missing something. And that is the arts are conduit towards mental health Right on. To be to becoming whole as a human being. Absolutely. Absolutely. So therefore, especially in a profession like acting or training actors, who have to be believable on camera or on stage, you would think the critics would understand that what you were doing is the right thing to do. Of course, the actors had the benefit as a result of studying with you and then being interviewed then. Yeah, but people who were not really influenced or did not really experience the work made judgments based on all the other acting techniques that were out there. Uh, you don't have to do all of that to be an actor. You don't have to. I, you, I mean, forget it. I mean, who, who wants to do that stuff? It's painful. Well, it's not only painful, it's liberating. It's, it's a discovery. It's, a, it's an exploration of who you are. Yeah, but... The greatest, the most, the critics that I had in the early years, and even now, are people who really don't understand what this is all about. Any one of those people, if I could get any one of those people on the stage in relation to an instrumental exercise or dealing with material, and I would creatively manipulate them into an experiential experience, they would immediately know what I was doing. But standing outside looking in, you don't get it. You don't get it. And that's okay. I'm not, trying, I'm not trying to corner the market on actors or acting or teaching. I just do what I do because I believe in it. What, what do you think it is exactly that, that you believe in so passionately to have uh, committed a life to, to, to being a, a mentor, a teacher? And, uh, what am I... Right. What, what, yeah. As an, like, what do you think the deeper intention is for you that, that really drives you to, to to have committed your life to this work? <laughs> I, I thought of something, but I'm not going to say it. Well, I mean, could it be love? No, I, I was going to say immortality. You know, but the reason I laughed is that that's not really what why I do what I do. But your question piqued that response. Now, I, you know, I don't think of what's going to be like when I'm gone. I'm just hoping that the people that I have taught, you know, there's over 100 people out there teaching my work exclusively that I know about. And I can give you their names and where they're teaching it. Now, that doesn't count for the people who, in the colleges that use my books, and the places that exclusively teach the Eric Moore system. I have three schools in Australia exclusively, Sydney, Queensland, and I, can, I always blank on the other name, the, the other big city in um, Australia. And I have people in, in, in uh, Argentina and uh, Turkey and so on and so forth, not counting all the people here. So I feel very grateful, grateful, that this work is being disseminated like a little circle in a pond. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Do you know I don't get any financial uh, return for, from any of those people? I don't ask for it. I don't want it. That's not what I'm talking about. The satisfaction I get is that we're disseminating this work in the world. So, yeah, I have a whole list, I, I don't have it with me, of the people who are teaching all over the world. And I'm in touch with them, either by email or by phone.
And yeah. they're excited about it. It has to be a very fulfilling experience to know that you've touched so many lives. It is. It's not only fulfilling, I'm very grateful for it, and it, it justifies my existence for me, for me, you know? Okay. You feel very, I'm sure you feel very grateful that you have, uh, you found this path that uh, brought you many uh, blessings, obviously, and, and the people around you. Yeah. yeah. I only started teaching by accident. Was that right after you were studying with Martin Landau? Well, he got, a, he got a big part in Cleopatra, and he was gone for a year, going to be gone to Rome for a year. I was without a teacher. So I started looking around, couldn't find anybody. I was very frustrated. I didn't have enough money to go to New York. My wife was pregnant at the time with our first child. I didn't have enough money to go to New York to study with Lee, so I was stuck. Uh, I was frustrated, devastated that I couldn't continue growing, learning. And a woman by the name Ann O'Hara, who was in Marty's class, called me one morning. I was living in a house in Burbank, really depressed. And I was working for my cousin as an apprentice mechanic at the time. I was acting, as, I was an actor too, and I was working as an actor, but this was my steady income. And Ann said, Eric, have you found anybody? I said, no. I'm afraid there's nobody out there. I've been all over the place. So why don't you start a class? I learned as much from you as I did from Marty. I said, Ann, I'm not a teacher. I'm an actor. She said, well, don't you think you could promote your own growth if you were teaching? Bingo. Light went off. Yes. So I started. I had one person. I had two people. I had three people. Then I had two people. I had four people. Then I had three people. I had five people. And I had four people. And I got seven or eight people. And I was teaching, and the first year of teaching, I was in the red. It cost me more to rent a place to teach than I was making. And uh, then Kurt Conway came into town. He was Marty's teacher, but didn't work at all like Marty, Broadway actor. And he asked Marty if he knew anybody that could teach beginners, because he didn't want to teach beginning actors. It was a thing. So Marty recommended me, because I was the one who worked the hardest in his classes, and Kurt contacted me and he watched me teach a class and he left me a note. He said, I got to leave early, but it has nothing to do. Here's the note. I read the note. It says, you are a born teacher. I would be honored for you to teach with me. So I was teaching my small classes and I was teaching people he was sending me for him. And the rest is history. I was with him for about four or five years. Then I went off on my own. So during that process of accepting the, the invitation and then actually physically going through the motions of being a teacher, uh, did it take you long to really own that and say, yeah, I'm a teacher again? Yeah. Or did you still have some doubt about your ability to teach? No, no. no I'm a master teacher. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't say that without any hesitation. Like a Dr. Water. No, no, I'm I, no. Right now, right now, I wasn't a master teacher for decades, decades maybe. But over the years and the work I've done and the experience and you know, uh, I have become a master teacher. I, I use this as a as an analogy. Do you want to be you? T you come to me and you say, I want to be a master juggler. What do I have to do to become a master juggler? I'd say, juggle every day of your life for the rest of your life. And someday you might be a master juggler. It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. Yes, I am a master teacher uh, without qualifications. And it's not, it's not, I'm not bragging. It's a fact. Okay? Do you feel or perceive or have you observed that uh, in our society perhaps we have forgotten about the, uh, the merit and the importance of apprenticeship, of having uh, uh, mentors other than just you know, your normal school teachers 
or at least having an appreciation for mentorship? Or do you think there's something lacking that you see around us? Just wonder. Oh yeah, I can answer that question. Do I see something lacking when I look around in terms of people's apprenticeship or need to learn and need to grow and need to find mentors? Yes. Uh, let me just point something out. It relates to our society, I guess. There was a, there was a, a book and some CDs and some DVDs that came out a few years ago called The Secret. Do you remember that? It was a dynamically instant success. Millions and millions and millions of dollars. And do you know why? I'm going to tell you. Because it allowed people to believe that they could get exactly what they wanted just by imagining it. That's not a lot of work, so I'm going to do it. And if I can be rich and famous and get everything I want by imaging it or imagining it, then that's all I have to do. See? Okay. Somebody came to my, uh, audit my class last week. I give everybody a free audit. I don't want them to jump in and I look them over, they look me over to see if it's a fit. I don't charge them for that audit said, well, they went to an, another teacher's class and there were 60 people in it. I said, 60 people? My classes are limited to 20 or under because I work with every single person in my class, every class. And I thought to myself, do you know why people seek out other venues, other places like The Secret or classes that they hear like cold reading classes or audition classes, which I, that's okay. They're all right, you know, I'm not against them. I don't think there's any such thing as a cold reading, but that's beside the point. Is because they don't want to do the work that it takes to accomplish the proficiency and the, the expertise that it takes decades to become a master at anything, a master person, a master painter, a master actor, a master director, master writer, a master anything, a master architect, it takes a lifetime, a lifetime to accomplish that. Most people don't want to do it. Now, for me, I work with a 93-year-old psychiatrist every Friday at 11 o'clock. I was there before I came here. Working on my stuff, attempting to deal with things that I still have to deal with to break through and liberate myself from. And I will do that until I die because it's necessary. I have two, two credos by which I have always lived. Well, most of my life. Stay hungry and keep reaching. That's one. Stay hungry and keep reaching. The other one is never get self-impressed. Never spend any time getting self-impressed because when you accomplish that, that's where you'll stay. You won't go any further. Those are two things. So, uh, to this day, you know, I get a lot of good, nice, grateful feedback. It's, it's, it's still difficult for me to accept. Not because I don't think I deserve it, but because I don't want it, I don't want it to get into me in terms of, yeah, I guess I'm, yeah, you know what I mean? I don't want that. I don't want that. You know, in every class I teach, I let people into seeing where I'm at and how I am. And I don't, make, I don't make it look like I've cornered the market or I've accomplished everything a human being can accomplish. When, when, when I don't know something, I say I don't know it. When I'm afraid of something, I say I'm afraid of that. When I say that I'm frustrated about accomplishing a certain thing, I say it. I say it when I talk about my writing and I sit down at the computer. And, 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 and this doesn't happen anymore, but for many years, 
I, this is the 10th book I'm writing. I've written a book on fiction, which I'm never going to publish. It was an exercise. Uh, I used to go up to Lake Arrowhead. I have a house up there where I was writing. And every time I would sit down at the typewriter in those days, there are no computers, <coughs> I would be totally convinced that this was the time that I wasn't going to be able to come up with it. I would drink coffee. I would go walking around the mountain. I'd come back and I'd sit down and I'd look at the blank paper. And I'd start to type a sentence. Then I would type two sentences. Then I'd type three and then I got a paragraph. And once I got the paragraph, the juices started going and I could write. But every time for many years even, I mean a several years anyway, at least two books, three books. I was sure I, got, I was be dry, a writer's block. I couldn't do it. So instead of saying that writing came easily to me, it's bullshit. It's not true. It didn't. And I'm going to say something, and I say to everybody and to all my classes and to all the people I've ever met, I am not a writer. I write. To me, a writer would have, to, to call myself a writer, I would have to have done as a writer in, in training and in experience what I've spent 67 years doing as an actor. I can call myself an actor. I'm a state-of-the-art actor because I worked at it for 67 years. But a writer, I'm not a writer, I write. Anybody can sit down and write. Is my stuff good? It's, it's readable, and it's factual, and it's instructive, and people get something from it. But a writer? No, I'm not a writer. You're an actor playing a writer. Well, okay, I'm an actor playing a writer. Then I would have to actually look for some kind of parallel in my passion and in my journey as an actor, as a parallel. Somehow I'd be able to creatively manipulate that into playing a writer who was a writer. You know, F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, people like Hemingway. These are writers. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, Samuel, Sam Shepard. He's an actor and he's a writer. He's a writer. But my friend Hampton Fancher, who wrote Blade Runner 1 and Blade Runner 2, my oldest living student, studied with me in the 60s. I love Hampton. He's a writer. Hampton is a writer, an actor and a writer. I'm not a writer. <laughs> you know, I have no illusions about that. One of the things that comes across to me in this conversation, especially the last few paragraphs, is that being human is an, is an artistic uh, endeavor. So to be living is an art? Yeah. Living is an art. Living is, <laughs> living is an art. Yeah. If, if you approach it that way, I, I want to say one other thing. In conclusion, God, what do I say? My, my idea of a responsibility from birth to death, from the time you're born to the time you die, your responsibility is to elevate your consciousness. That is what we all must do. And at the highest level of consciousness, there would be no war. There would be no killing. There would be none of the things that, 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 that the animalistic uh, desires of man to, to murder, destroy, hunt, kill animals, kill people. That wouldn't exist. Because as you become conscious, really conscious, it doesn't make any sense. From my experience, uh, it, it really appears that the arts are a direct route to Becoming more conscious. I agree. No, I agree. I agree totally. I agree totally. I've been collecting art since I was 40 years old. I have a wonderful collection of art. Uh, I don't have any more wall room on two houses. 
I, incredible collection over the years, and I collect what I like. It's eclectic. It's no one person, no one artist. It's eclectic. If it appeals to me, if it, if it touches me, if I get something from it, I have it. And so I can't draw a straight line. I'm not talented that way. But my appreciation of people who can is the utmost, you know. I really, 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 really admire people who paint. I have some wonderful, I have some wonderful art. I sometimes sit in my living room and I look at my paintings that are in, in, that, in that venue, but they're all over the house. I just look at them for a long time and just allow myself to experience what I'm experiencing from painting on the wall, how it affects me. Seeing things in it I never saw before. <laughs> I have a story. When I was in the army, uh, I was in a play with a woman actress by the name of Ruth Warshawski. She was married to a great artist, Abel G. Warshawski. He hangs in the Louvre, he hangs in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, he hangs in all over the world. He's a master artist, master artist. As a matter of fact, he painted the portrait of Bing Crosby for the Pebble Beach golf thing, it's still there. I used to visit him two, three times a week. Now he would sit there, he was crippled by arthritis. He was a wonderful man. He would sit at his easel, light coming in from the windows, and he had this cabinet that stretched totally across the room. Doors, cabinet. And they were filled with his paintings. And he was painting, and one day I said, Buck, his nickname was Buck. Buck, why are your, your paintings in the cabinet, not on the walls? He had a couple of paintings on the walls of, of, his, of his wife, Ruth. He said, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. He said, if I put a painting up where I could see it, I would see all the flaws and all the things that I still had to do to make that painting what I would want it to be. So it would stop me from painting. I never, never forgot that. Never, never forgot that. I, I saw a virtuoso, uh, I guess he was a musician of some kind. He was interviewed by somebody and he said, the interviewer said, I don't know what was, you know, it was very interesting. He said, well, do you feel like you have done it, accomplished your goal? He said, no, I can't say that. He said, I'm still looking for that one note that I haven't found yet. <laughs> I went, why, God, yes, I, I, I understood him in a microsecond. I don't know that anybody else would have understood what he just said. But in a microsecond, it's no, I'm still looking for that one note and I can't find it yet. And I haven't found it yet. It hit me right in the chest. I knew what he meant. I knew what he meant. So that's it. I'm through.